neither the left wing or the right wing really wanted to hear that. So Mao Zedong was in, and the also Mao Zedong's section, his his section was, they would call him the rifle faction because they were known for uh, being very, um, when they spoke they were very inflammatory and they, you know, and, um, and you know, they, they did have somewhat of an obsession with violence. Um, because uh, when the peasant movement began in China, around 1927 is when Mao wrote his defense, his report on the, 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 the peasant movements in Hunan. It was a defense because the rest of the party were, were, were saying that these peasants, when they, ri when they had their revolts in the Hunan province, they were so brutal to the landlords. And what Mao wrote you know, in, 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 in the thing was defending that. And he said, look, these people are angry. Uh, you know, if they want to get a little revenge, that's fine by me because they've been suffering for a long time. And, you know, and that's where the famous quote from Mao Zedong, revolution is not a dinner party, comes. Uh, he, and, and the full block quote is, revolution is not a dinner, dinner party. It is not painting a picture or writing an essay. It is an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. So, what were they called? The rifle. The rifle faction. Yeah. And um, another interesting thing about Mao Zedong that kind of distinguished him was that Mao Zedong had been a teacher um, and a librarian. He was very well read, and and he was also a very good public speaker. And he had very a very charismatic personality. Um, and he was definitely not an ally of the, the folks that were loyal to the Communist International, but he was also not an ally of the left opposition. He was his own movement. Kind of a mythology has been created. There's that book, uh, the, the Jang Halliday, you know, attack mm -hmm. on, on Mao, Mao the Unknown Story, that tries to make the case that Mao was Stalin's hitman. Which has been completely decimated right. by about a hundred scholars. Right. So I mean, a, a lot of them anti-Maoists themselves. Right, right. Yeah. and it's, it's utter nonsense. I mean, Mao was independent. Um, and so then, you know, so as, as uh, the, you know, the communists were, you know, ultimately, you know, Stalin did win out in the, the debate with the left opposition, and the Communist Party did dissolve into the Nationalist Party. At this time, Sun Yat-sen had died, and the leader of the Nationalist Party was Sun Yat-sen's uh, cousin or son or something like that, Chiang Kai-shek. Some kind of relative of Sun Yat-sen was Chiang Kai-shek, and Chiang Kai-shek um, he, he was the leader of the party, and he was calling for communists to be barred from the party, but he couldn't get a majority vote on that. So, uh, in 1927, Chiang Kai-shek famously <coughs> took over, and his followers, they took control of the party with guns, and they banned the communists and, start, and actually set up some of the first prison camps for communists, uh, you know, like concentration camp type things for the communists. And the vast majority, we're talking 90% of the members of the Chinese Communist Party were killed during this period. What percent? Ninety percent. Like thousands and thousands put into death camps, killed, because Sonia, uh, you know, Chiang Kai-shek was an anti-communist, and he wanted to ally with the U.S., okay, and he believed the U.S. could, could be his ally in, in fighting the monarchy, and that, and that he didn't want, you know, the, um, you know, the, the Chinese uh, communists to be his allies. And so Chinese communists were killed, and famously, as they were being killed, um, in some areas when Chiang Kai-shek's forces were coming to purge the communists from the parties, uh, in two cities there were uprisings of the workers. In Shanghai, there was the Shanghai Commune, where the workers and the, and the unions and all that were ready to fight. And when you know, Chiang Kai-shek was coming uh, to, to kill all the communists in the Nationalist Party, they revolted and took control of the city, and there was a military standoff for several days. There was also the... Uh, a much shorter, but but much more celebrated, much more well-known was the Can Commune of Canton, where the same thing mm -hmm. happened when Chiang Kai-shek was coming to purge the communists from the nationalist movement. The communists took control of the city and set up a commune based on the Paris Commune of 1871. There were Those were the two heroic revolts. But uh, the Trotskyist movement historically has blamed the, um, the Stalinists for forcing China to dissolve its, uh, its Communist Party into the ranks of the nationalists instead of building up class independence. And, and the accusation has been made that that led the, uh, the Chinese communists set them up to be slaughtered because they didn't have their own independence. Um, Chiang Kai-shek, you know, famously was trained in Russia. You know, he was given military training in Russia, uh, and as were the nationalist forces. In the forces. Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, I, yeah. You know, uh, yes. there, there was all kinds of sections like that. So, with 90% of the party dead, Mao Zedong survived. And Mao Zedong's faction survived, and it just so happened that that was about the time that, um, like we talked about in our previous class, that Stalin had his great swing to the left, the third period. And that was kind of good for Mao Zedong, because he was already the ultra-left kind of rifle faction guy. So that was kind of convenient. So Mao Zedong started assuming power. But 
like I said, there is a mythology that's been created that, that Mao Zedong was an agent of Stalin, but it was the other way around. Stalin actually sent people to China to court Mao Zedong, right? Mao Zedong was talking his own line, and they, the Communist International courted Mao because they saw him as an ally, and Mao was even thinking of setting up an independent party. Because Mao's great belief was that China, uh, the Chinese Revolution didn't necessarily have to be led by the working class that you could have what he called the block of four classes, which were the, uh, the workers, uh, the poor peasants, the rich peasants, and the petty bourgeoisie, or the national bourgeoisie. And that was, you know, the Chinese Communist Party was not a proletarian party. Um, it did have proletarian sections. But at the same time, in China, there was not much of a proletariat. Like I said, it was a largely agrarian society. So Mao Zedong had the block of four classes. And the Chinese Communist Party was supposed to represent four classes, not one. It wasn't supposed to be just represent the proletariat. It was supposed to represent four classes. So Mao Zedong, now he developed his military strategy, which was called the, uh, the, the theory of people's war. And it was very effective in China. Um, and it, it's also been very effective in Vietnam, Korea, and elsewhere. It would definitely not be very effective in this country. But the theory of people's war is basically, you know, Mao Zedong and, and a few intellectual followers they would pull their money and buy five or six guns, and they'd go out into the middle of the countryside, and there'd be one area where there's, you know, one armed guy that keeps the, the, the peasants in line, and they'd show up, all five or six of them, with their guns, and they'd blow him away, and they'd say, we're the new ones in charge. They'd give the peasants some land, they'd teach people to read, and then they'd recruit all the peasants to join their army, and they'd go over to the next county and do the same thing. And then they would, you know, do the same thing and replicate it, and eventually you get all these expanding territories throughout the countryside, until you build up enough strength and enough recruits from doing that that then you strangle the cities. Um, and and that, that was the theory of people's war. Um, and uh, Mao Zedong's the, the basis for the people's war, he recruited mainly intellectuals and, and, and college students. Uh, he recruited from the cities and um, he was very effective in his propaganda of, of telling these college students, come and be part of the glorious revolution to free China. So they'd show up and they, he'd train them and then they'd go out and then they would organize with the peasants. And one aspect of Mao's ideology was that, that the army shouldn't stand above the people. Um, they had these, this, a list of ten rules that were expected to be followed. Uh, you know, Chinese, um, when you were in, in the People's Liberation Army, whether a man or a woman, you could not have sexual relations with a peasant, no matter what, uh, because that could set up an inappropriate relationship. You could not even accept a gift from the peasants. If the peasants wanted to give you food, you couldn't take it, right? Because that, that again, could set up a relationship where you're expected. The idea was that the, the peasants were, the, the army was to serve the people and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and and uh, so, you know, Mao Zedong was leading this people's war. Um, and the, the, the dates of this now? Uh, we're talking 31, 32, 31, 32, you know. And at the time, Japan invaded. Chiang Kai-shek, who was, was then leading the country, they defeated the emperor, and it was Chiang Kai-shek, didn't actually want to fight Japan. He was actually hoping that Japan could come in and take care of the communist problem. Yeah. And that was the reason, ultimately, that Japan did invade Manchuria, the, the northern region of China, was because that was a, the, you know, the U.S. press openly supported when, when uh, Japan, was invaded, uh, Japan invaded Manchuria because they said that, that Manchuria, the, you know, the, the, you know was, there was a communist insurgency there and that the Japanese could come in and straighten it out. And that was kind of the thinking. So when, uh, when Japan invaded, Chiang Kai-shek didn't want to fight them. And so a few of Chiang Kai-shek's generals who still believed in Chinese nationalism kidnapped Chiang Kai-shek and um, took him to an island where they surrounded him with guns, tortured him for a couple days, and then flew Mao in on, a, on an airplane and got Mao to sign a, uh, a contract with them, okay, that, that they would have a united front against the Japanese. Really? Yes, Chiang Kai-shek was extremely reluctant. He did not want to fight the Japanese because he hated the communists more. But, so he was forced by his own officers to do it. So then they had uh, what Mao called the uh, united front against imperialism. And so the Japanese invaded, and so the... The, the communists and the nationalists were in an alliance to drive out the Japanese invaders. However, Chiang Kai-shek was still in charge, and Chiang Kai-shek hated the communists more, and so what Chiang Kai-shek's strategy was is, we'll, we'll fight a few symbolic battles here, we'll, you know, you know, attack a fort here or there, but we're going to make the communists do most of the fighting. 
And then the Jap you know, and then after after World War II, after the you know the Japanese are defeated, why then we'll be in charge because they'll have all died uh, fighting. 